Have you ever heard that magnetic forces do no work? I remember sitting in E&M class, like baby undergrad version of E&M class, like 11 or 12 years ago. I was just, I was sitting in class staring at this book. I have the book, hang on. Literally this copy of this book. And on page 207 of this book, there is the statement, magnetic forces do no work in bold. And it's boxed, which means it's very important. And this, this is of course confusing. You know, like work, we'll talk more about work, but I mean, if you do work on a box and you pick it up, you know, you've done work on it. And if you have a magnet and you, you want to pick up a box, <laughs> the work happened. How, how can magnetic forces do no work? Um, what's weird is that I went on to graduate school and I took more E&M classes and I never ran into this again. I had just taken magnetic forces do no work in bold in a box and put it in my brain and be like, okay, that's a true fact. Just remember that. But also you don't really understand that. And it, uh, it just, it never came up again. So this is a very selfish video with an audience of only me. This is the third edition of this book. So in the event that you, you took e &M in undergrad between like what, 2005 and 2015, probably you also might have this same issue. So that it, this video is for us and everyone else probably doesn't have a problem with magnetic forces do no work. So let's do it. For reasons that will become clear later, this is the second time I'm recording this video. And in between me editing the first version, I, looked on YouTube to see if anyone had already made this video so I could steal thumbnail ideas. That's fine. Is that okay? I don't know. L link me to the YouTube police below if that's okay. But I found this video from Science Asylum six years ago and I like his videos and also he says exactly what I say in this video which I'm gonna guess 35 minutes long and he says it in five minutes so if you watch my videos and you're like stop talking and just tell me why you go watch this video instead he's gonna say the same thing i'm gonna say but he's gonna say it in five minutes we have to start with work if you watched my how to teach yourself physics video you've probably been studying your survey like very seriously and you might have already gotten to the chapter on energy and work and they, they note something really interesting about work, which is that work is one of the first physics words you get to on your learning physics journey, where the meaning in real life is very different from the meaning in physics. Like when I ask like what you do for work, you, you would answer with what your job is and how you make money. But in physics, work is this. A measure of energy transferred by an action over some distance. If you apply a force to an object and it is displaced, meaning it moved from its original position, work has been done on that object. If the force is constant, meaning you don't have to do an interval, you've probably seen this much more familiar version where work is equal to force times displacement times the cosine of the angle between the, those two vectors. Work is a scalar. Um, this is a dot product. So work is a scalar, just like energy. And also just like energy, the unit is Newton meters or joules. Work is part of newfangled physics. So you have old fangled physics, which is like the Greeks where you have statics and your simple machines. And then new physics happens when you start looking at dynamics and forces and how bodies are moving. So work is a result of a force being applied to a body and that body moving. So it's in the new physics. So there's this great quote from the 1630s from Rene Descartes about work, although he would not call it work because work as a term applied in physics wasn't until like the 1850s but he, he was very specifically talking about work. Let me read it to you. Lifting 100 pounds one foot twice over is the same as lifting 200 pounds one foot or 100 pounds two feet. We can just do that with math, right? And calculate the work, right? So if you have a box of 100 pounds and you lift it one foot, the work done is 100 foot pounds. If you do that twice, the work done is 200 foot pounds. 
if you have a box that weighs 200 pounds and you lift it one foot, the work done is also 200 foot pounds. And if you have a box that weighs 100 pounds and you lift it two feet, the work done is also 200 foot pounds. I, I'm interested that he used foot pounds. I don't know when, like, I don't know the history of metric and when people started using it, but I looked it up. He did say foot pounds and I'm not one to hate on units. I don't really care about all the discourse on what the best units are, but I do think foot pounds are bad because there is a different unit called a pound foot that is different and refers to something different. Um, and that's confusing. I realized that someone had to understand that first, like someone had to write that down as an idea. But it's just funny to me that in the 1630s, Descartes could be like, man, lifting a 100 pound box two feet is the same as lifting a 200 pound box one foot. And everyone was like, oh, shit. So let's do a work problem. Imagine you're moving because you live in America and you're renting and rent's expensive and you have to move every single year. And so every single year you pack up all your books into little boxes and you carry them down the steps and you put them on a truck and you move them to a second place where you carry them up the steps and you unpack them only to do it again in like 11 months. Imagine that's happening. So you bring your stupid boxes that weigh like 20 kilograms down to the street and the truck you've rented comes up and you need to pick up the 20 kilogram box and move it one meter up onto the truck. So you do that one time. Work has been done on a box, but then the rental truck guy pulls a little ramp and now you can push the boxes up the ramp. Which of these situations, picking the box up or pushing it up a ramp, do you think has more work done. We can just calculate it. Okay, so in the first situation, you pick a box up, it weighs 20 kilograms, and you move it one meter. Work is force times distance times the cosine of angle between those two vectors. So a 20 kilogram box, picking it up, you just need to calculate the weight of the box. That's the force. So it's 20 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared times one meter and then cosine of the angle between those two vectors. But you're applying a force upward and the direction of motion is upward. So the cosine of zero is just one. So 200 joules of work has been done. Calculating the work done using the ramp is more complicated because you have to calculate the force unless you're doing it from an energy perspective. I know, but that's not the point of this exercise, okay? Okay, so we draw a free body diagram. Uh, imagine you have a ramp that's 30 degrees from the ground and it's going to push up to that one meter height. So we know that side of the triangle is one meter. We can draw a little free body diagram where we have a box and we are applying a push force up a ramp with the same 30 degree angle. The normal force will always be 90 degrees from the position of the box. So it is now 90 degrees from the push force. And of course, gravity is pulling straight down. I always find these problems easier to do if you rotate the free body diagram so that your two forces that are 90 degrees apart make a little, a little plane. Okay. Uh, now I'm realizing I should have said some physics words. Assume you're pushing with a constant force. So the acceleration of this box is zero. Assume that the ramp is frictionless. Great. Okay. That, I think that's all we needed. So now we know in the y direction, we have the normal force pushing straight up and we have the y component of gravity pulling down. Those are gonna cancel because this box is not jumping up and down. So if we wanna calculate what the force that we push on the box is, we just set that equal to that minus x component of the gravitational force. So we get F push is equal to mass times gravity times the sine of 30 degrees, which is 20 kilograms times 10 meters per second times sine 30, which gives us 100 newtons. So that is our force. If we wanna calculate the work, we need to do force times distance times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. And we need the distance to be the hypotenuse of our ramp. So if we have this 30 degree angle from the ground and we know the far side is exactly one meter tall, we know the ramp is two meters long. That's a special type of triangle. Okay, so work is equal to our 100 newtons of push force times two meters, which is equal to 200 joules. We did it, yay. So in both cases, 200 joules of work. So if you were looking at this originally, you would be like, well, I would much rather use the ramp 
is going to be easier. And that's true. The force you're required to apply to the box is 100 newtons compared to 200 newtons. But you're applying that force over a longer distance, so the work ends up being the same. I think this is one of the interesting things about work as a physics concept. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Of course, that leads into the work energy theorem. So in both cases, the box is given potential energy. It's taken from the ground up to some height of one meter. So if you had used the work energy theorem before, you would have been like, of course the work is the same in both cases. The same amount of potential energy is given to the box in both cases. Um, but I just wanted to show you with a force diagram. So let's actually look at the work energy theorem for a second. I take a box and I move it up some height. Work has been done on the box, right? I applied a force, a push force upward over some distance, whatever this change in distance is, work has been done, right? But if you think of this with respect to the work energy theorem, which says that the net work done on an object is equal to its change in kinetic energy, you would realize that there's no net work done on this box, which net work sounds like the word network, which is just one word, but I mean network as in two words. That's because here, the box is at rest, the velocity is zero, so the kinetic energy is zero. I move it upward to some height, the box is at rest, the kinetic energy is zero. So if the net work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy, the net work done is zero. And that's kind of <sighs> the most boring part of physics, uh, the physics accounting. How you solve a problem, like how much work is done in this situation, depends on how your system is set up. So if it's just me and the box, I say I applied a force to the box, the work done on this box was done by me, and it's whatever the weight is times the distance I've moved it, right? But if you think of it from the work energy theorem, what is actually happening is I am doing work on the earth to take this box away from it. And the earth is doing negative work on this box to give it potential energy. So the net work done on this box is zero because I did the same amount of work on the earth that the earth does on the box. And instead the energy transfer was that this box now has potential energy. That's two ways of looking at the same problem and you get the same answer, but it's, <laughs> I find it very boring. I realize it's important. It's important to define your problem when you're doing physics, of course, but when we're doing elementary problems like that, the, the, the discussion on like, well, technically the earth is also moving in the galaxies. And it's just like, ah, it's not important, but there's a nugget of interesting thing there. A little nugget of something that's very interesting, which, you know, survey takes and puts on the side of the text with some little, I think I don't have the book in front of me, it's either red or blue, and it, it tells you to focus on something interesting, um, which is the interesting little nugget that I think we get by looking at that problem two different ways, which is this. If I take this box and I rip it away from the earth, and then the earth does work, negative work on the box to give it potential energy, my body me, I am the person doing the action. I am the thing applying the force, but the earth is what gave this energy, right? That's kind of interesting. I did the force. I did the forcing. I did the push, but the earth gives this potential energy. I don't give it potential energy. So when you're looking at these problems, it's not always obvious what is doing the action and what is giving the energy. Work is a transfer of energy. When we move things, we're taking energy from someplace and putting it another place. And the physics accounting becomes important to track where all of that's going. Okay, let's, let's take that little nugget of information and put it in our brains and move on to electricity and magnetism. There is an electric force, it's the Coulomb force, it looks like this, it looks a lot like the gravitational force, but it is a force between charged particles. Imagine I have like a five micro Coulomb, Coulomb charged particle and like a three micro Coulomb charged particle. According to the Coulomb force law, these are both positively charged, they're both gonna go like this. 
So we can calculate the force from this charge on this charge and then use that force to calculate the work that is done on this particle as it moves away. And to do that, we can do a fun little integral. And I'm not going to read the math because I, I hate reading math. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just place it here. So we can calculate the force from the Coulomb force law and get a value for the work that was done. But we also know work was done because of the work energy theorem, right? This guy was at rest, it started moving, it's got a change in energy, work was done on this particle. But magnetism, like the gravitational force looks like this, the electric force looks like this, the force due to magnetism is QV cross B, where V is velocity and B is the magnetic field. The force is equal to a cross product. That means that the resulting force will always be perpendicular to the velocity and also the magnetic field. So if your magnetic field is going this way and your particle has a velocity that's this way, the force is going to be this way. Our work equation has that cosine theta and cosine of 90 degrees is always going to be zero. So definitively, because of this, this is the Lorentz force equation. Because the magnetic force is always going to be the result of QV cross B, magnetic forces can do no work. Just look at it. Like, work is equal to force times distance times cosine theta. This angle will always be 90 degrees. The magnetic force can do no work. Look at the boxed equation. That's why it's boxed. Interesting things have come out of this, though, and have led to really important developments in, like, technologies and how we look at particles. Imagine this is our charged particle, and the magnetic field is into the, into the, the computer that you're, you're watching this on, and this particle is moving up. We know that the magnetic force cannot change the velocity of this particle, but it will change the direction of this motion. So what you get is circular motion. So if you've ever seen tracks from like cloud chambers where you get those cool spirals that that's because you have a magnetic field and you have a charged particle and once that particle enters the magnetic field it just starts traveling in a circle and you also get where there are two circles right next to each other that's where you have like pair production like suddenly you have an electron and an anti-electron they're gonna go in circles that are in opposite directions because they have opposite charge because it's q v cross b and an electron is like plus one and an anti-electron is minus one it's also how mass spectrometers work so if you have isotopes of a molecule and uh, which means isotopes means that they have the same charge, but they have different mass because some of them have more neutrons. You can use Newton's second law because you know the force due to the magnetic field is QV cross B, and you know that the acceleration is going to be circular motion, so F equals MA, it's going to be mass times V squared over R. And you can rearrange this to get the radius of the little arc that the charged particle will take, which gives you... R is equal to MV over QB, and you know Q, and you know B, because it's the magnetic field you made, and you know the velocity, and using the radius that you measure, you can calculate the mass of those particles. And you can get a nice little spectra of abundances, like which isotopes are going to be the most abundant. You can just, you can just measure that. That's really cool. So these concepts are how big machines like CERN work. You can use a dialed in electric field to change the velocity of the beam of particles and you can use a magnetic field to change the path to guide them where you want them. That's really cool. That's cool. Okay. But it doesn't really answer the question. Does it? Does it? I have a box. I have a magnet. Did I do it? Okay, I'm gonna try to actually. Okay, I have a box and I have a magnet. The magnet picked up the box. I didn't pick up the box. Hopefully, I can't really tell. I'm scared of magnets. Hopefully, you saw the magnet pick up the box. I didn't pick up the box. If magnetic fields cannot do work, what did the work? What picked up the box? I've seen magnets pick up cars. What's doing the work? And you think, you think that below the little boxed text, there would be an explanation for that. 
Let me read it to you. Magnetic forces do no work. This follows because V cross B is perpendicular to V, so V cross B dot V is zero. This is what I was saying before, the velocity and the magnetic field vector directions are always perpendicular, so when you dot them back into the velocity, you will always get zero. Magnetic forces can do no work because the Lorentz force equation holds. Right, that's what he's saying. Magnetic forces may alter the direction in which a particle moves, but they cannot speed it up or slow it down. The fact that magnetic forces do no work is an elementary and direct consequence of the Lorentz force law. But there are many situations in which it appears so manifestly false that one's confidence is bound to waver. God, I love Griffiths. He writes such fun sentences. Okay, when magnetic crane lifts the carcass of a junked car, for instance, something is obviously doing work, and it seems perverse to deny that magnetic force is responsible. Well, perverse or not, deny it we must, and it can be a very subtle matter to figure out what agency does deserve credit in such circumstances. This is the little nugget of interesting thing I was talking before. I pick up the box, but I do not give the box potential energy. The earth does that. The magnet picks up the, the box, but the magnetic force is not doing work on the box. So something else must be doing work on the box. And then he says, I'll show you several examples as we go along. And then his problems. And then he talks about currents. So just a note, I feel like that's bad. <laughs> I specifically remember sitting in like a week of lectures where I was ignoring what the professor was saying and I was trying to figure this out. Maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe you got it from what was happening in that small paragraph. But you say something is doing the work. What What's doing the work then? Because something is doing the work. It would be great if you did show me, and I'm sure he does. I was, of course, an undergrad, and undergrads are just no notoriously bad at reading books. You gotta read the books, actually. So I'm sure if I were to just keep this in my brain and focus and read the rest of this book, he would have explained to me what was happening. But he did not. And as I said earlier, I just put this in my brain as like, okay, magnetic forces do no work. I know the equation, I get it, but what what's doing the work? And I went to grad school, and I took Jackson e and and it just never came up again. Like, we did work problems. So why was I so confused in this book? And I think it's because he doesn't explain what's doing the work. Like, that would just be a great moment to say, and here's an example. But he says, well, we'll do it. It's coming up. But the reason I'm making this video is because I learned that in the fourth edition of this book, Griffiths added a whole new section called Magnetic Forces Do No Work. And I was immediately just like rushed back to undergrad where I was sitting there like, magnetic forces do no work, then what's picking up the box? And I was like, oh yay, this will answer this question I've had in my brain for 10 years that just never came up again, so I didn't think to investigate it. So the first thing I would like to say is David Griffiths, I have now bought two copies of the third edition, one PDF of the fourth edition. I have your quantum book. I have your particle book. You've made so much money from me, but you deserve it. You write great textbooks. I do like them. The second thing I want to say is nobody send this to David Griffiths because I think he hates people that talk to him about this. He is so snarky in this new chapter. He must have received thousands of emails where students were like, but I've seen cars picked up by cranes. Like I can pick up a paperclip. What are you talking about? <laughs> and he's so mad about it that this chapter is specifically for those idiots like me who are like, okay, but I'm a little confused by what you wrote down. Like I get it. I agree with the Lorentz force law. I understand, but what's, what's doing the work though? Here's my evidence for that. So this is section 8.3, magnetic forces do no work. And there's a note that says, this section can be skipped without loss of continuity. I include it for those readers who are disturbed by the notion that magnetic forces do no work. And I just, I'm not disturbed, man. I'm just confused. Like I'm not disagreeing with you. You just need to explain it to me better. I, I understand the Lorentz force law, but I see this happen in real life. So just tell me what's actually happening. I'm not disagreeing with you yet. Spoilers. So he does an example of a big electromagnet picking up a junkyard car. 
and he says you flip on the electromagnet well this is my interpretation of what he says i don't you get it okay so you flip on the electromagnet there's a changing magnetic field the little magnet particles in the car get an induced current around it a faraday emf right or an induced emf and in addition to that current that is now on the car there's a changing magnetic field due to that so in the magnet there's another little induced emf called emotional emf and the interaction of those two currents is what lifts the car up. They increase the potential energy of the car. Watching a magnet pick up a car, you are watching the electric force do the work, but the magnet is providing the energy. Just like me picking up the box, I'm applying the force, but the earth is doing the potential energy. Okay, fine. This whole section, he's just very salty. The fact that magnetic fields do no work follows directly from the Lorentz force law. So if you think you've discovered an exception, you're going to have to explain why the law is incorrect. And I just, like, it's, it's not that I think the Lorentz force law is incorrect. It's that I didn't understand what was picking up the car. I didn't understand what was doing the work if it wasn't the magnetic field or the force due to the magnetic field. So... I mean, you could have just put that in. I've already recorded this video and I learned some new information. Um, so first, let me tell you what I said in the first version. He's got a little section in here where he says, if you found an exception to the Lorentz force law, if you have found a reason for magnetic forces to do work, you have to change the Lorentz force law to account for that. And he says, for example, if magnetic monopoles exist, the force on a particle with electric charge QE and magnetic charge QM becomes this. I think I've talked about this in a different video. So in that case, a magnetic field would do work on magnetic monopoles. But, you know, magnetic monopoles don't exist. So this isn't a valid case. But he's using that as an example of like, okay, but the Lorentz force law would change. But then he says... A less radical possibility is that in addition to electric charges, there exist permanent point magnetic dipoles, parentheses, electrons, question mark? Why? What's happening? I, this is what confused me in the last recording of this video. I thought this was a joke because electrons... Like, electrons do have permanent point magnet dipoles. They have quantum spin. That, that's what an electron is. It has a spin vector. And magnetic fields can do work on spin. They can do work on point magnetic dipoles. And they do. And then he says the Lorentz force law acquires an extra term. The magnetic field can do work on these intrinsic, in air quotes, what... Why is it in quotes? Intrinsic dipoles, electrons, they have spin. Is it a joke? Which experience no motional or Faraday EMF? By the way, motional versus Faraday EMF is another like physics accounting thing that I don't understand. Like I take a voltmeter and I measure an induced current. I can't tell the difference in motional or Faraday EMF. I understand that you could point me to a definition that explains the differences in them, but physically in the world, why do they have two different names when they're the same thing? It doesn't make any sense. But that's a totally different video. Here's what he says. I don't know whether a consistent theory can be constructed in this way, but in any event, it is not classical electrodynamics, which is predicated on Ampere's assumption that all magnetic phenomena are due to electric charges in motion and point magnetic dipoles must be interpreted as the limits of tiny current loops. So I recorded this video after reading this to you, and I was like, this must be a joke because... This is a classical electrodynamics book, and he doesn't want to talk about spin, which is how magnets work. You have a material that has magnetic properties. It's a magnet, right? It is made up of atoms, and inside those atoms are electrons that have intrinsic dipole moments that have an orientation. And for some reason, a certain fraction of those dipole moments are aligned, and so you have magnetic properties inside that little guy due to quantum spin. And as he says, in the presence of intrinsic magnetic dipoles that are not tiny current loops, they are intrinsic dipoles, magnetic forces can do work on those. And I think that's why this never came up again. The little box 
magnetic forces do no work is in my brain, but it never came up again in graduate school because right after you take this class, you do quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, you learn about spin and that's how you start dealing with magnets and stuff with spin. So I thought this was a joke, like a little like, ha ha, you'll find out about this when you take my next class because I know David Griffiths knows about spin. He wrote the book on it. It's over here. I'm not going to grab it. Here's a picture of it. He wrote the book on it, right? He knows. He knows. He also wrote the particle physics. He knows. He knows what spin is. What's happening here? And I edited that video and I was like, maybe he's telling a joke, but it didn't sit well with me because he has not in italics. And then he says classical electrodynamics and classical electrodynamics does not have spin. And so I searched David Griffiths classical electrodynamics and I found something that made me re-record this whole video. Let me show it to you. So I'm on the American Institute of Physics website and they do these oral histories, which I quote so often in videos, I think, hopefully I'm linking to these, where they interview physicists with these great careers and they just ask them a bunch of questions and they're pages and pages long and they're just so fascinating and good. Here is David Griffiths. He talks about a lot of cool stuff. He talks a lot about the gap between uh, experimental physics and theoretical physics right now because experiments are so expensive and they're so precise and they require so much funding that it's much harder to get an experimental project off the ground and the theorists are kind of just with their computers and it's it's a really interesting interview i will link it below but there's something about magnetic forces do no work so i'm gonna read that to you now David, just a snapshot in time, circa June 2021. What have you been working on yourself of late? And more generally, what's been compelling you more broadly in physics? And David Griffiths talks about uh, compiling his PhD advisor's Sidney Coleman's notes on relativity, which sounds really interesting. And then he's talking about, he calls it a modest project, but I thought it sounded really interesting, where he uh, is looking at a charged particle in a field of an infinite wire carrying a uniform current. So the magnetic field of an infinite steady current goes like one in R and it circles around the wire. But he's been studying the motion in a cylindrical field and sound and he finds that it makes like a double helix and he's working with it. That sounds really cool. I want to read that paper. But then, okay, let me read it to you. Another project that I'm working on, but I don't know that this will issue in any kind of publication, is a friend of mine at Harvard, Jacob Barandes, you might possibly have run into him, has constructed an electromagnetic theory, classical electromagnetism of intrinsic electromagnetic dipoles. This is what he was talking about in the book. Okay, just that sentence already, I know that that wasn't a joke. I think David Griffiths, and honestly, he might say this in the book, and I just didn't catch it into my brain. I obviously did not reread the whole entire fourth edition for this video. I think he thinks this book is not electricity and magnetism. It is instead classical electrodynamics. So he is not including quantum mechanics at all. So in your, in your pre-quantum mechanics classical electrodynamics, you don't have spin. So he won't include it in the book. And he's saying, I don't know, angular momentum requires an object to rotate and you can't have a point rotation because that's quantum mechanics. He's not joking when he says it does not fit into this theory. He's, he's really talking about a version of classical mechanics that predates quantum mechanics. Let, let's keep reading. You start with a particle with intrinsic spin and a number of people from time to time have investigated whether there's such a thing as a classical, purely classical theory of intrinsic spin. Particles that carry spin that's not associated with any motion but simply is. Like the spin of an electron in quantum mechanics. See, he wants something that's not quantum mechanics. A classical mechanical version of an electron spin. That's so interesting. Okay. Ordinarily, in a classical context, if you're talking about spin, you have in mind something like the rotation of the Earth on its axis, daily rotation. Well, that's actually orbital motion of all the rocks and dirt clouds that make up the Earth. So in that sense, 
Classically, spin is really just a composite object that's rotating, perhaps in a limit as the size is very small. But the question is, could you construct a classical theory of intrinsic spin the way that the spin of the electron is intrinsic? It's a true point particle in quantum theory. We know you can do it quantum mechanically. Can you do it classically? <laughs> that's what he wants to do. That's what he's talking about. This blew my mind. I thought he was joking, but literally the the book that he has written introduction to electrodynamics he's doing it classically and my god man why didn't you just say that just this is a classical electrodynamics book of course we could talk about spin but that is not classical electrodynamics just write that sentence in the book why not it was so confusing that i thought you were joking i thought you were joking when you were like maybe electrons have spin goodness um, he says Bernard has come up with a theory. He's not 100% convinced that it's internally consistent yet, but he's interested in looking at it, obviously, to answer this question, because the reason that this is intriguing to me is that in my electrodynamics book, I make a point of fact that the magnetic forces can do no work. That falls directly from the Lorentz force law. It's an open-shut case in classical electrodynamics. I'm sorry. It is as clear as can be, but everybody has their example of a magnet lifting a paperclip or a magnetic crane lifting a junk car or something like that, in which it sure looks as though the magnetic forces are doing work. So I've had over the years more complaints than any other comments on my ENM book. How can you claim that magnetic fields do no work when obviously they do? This is what I was saying where I was like, I bet he's received like thousands of letters and then emails and now like random YouTube videos and comments. Don't send this to him. He's tired of hearing it. And he's just annoyed. I think he's so annoyed at us for being like, but what do you mean? That he didn't realize he could just write a single sentence which says, of course we could talk about quantum mechanics spin, but we're not doing that here. This is classical electrodynamics. Just write that sentence down, dude. And then you wouldn't have confused a generation of people. I'm so sorry. I love your books. They're great. It's just this little thing. I feel bad. I love his books. Don't send this to him. Okay. Well, I've always assumed that was essentially a quantum mechanical thing that simply had no explanation in true classical electrodynamics. But if Berendiz is right, there does exist a classical theory, it's beyond electrodynamics. It's not classical electrodynamics because in classical electrodynamics, magnetism has to be associated with the motion of electric charges and there are no intrinsic dipole moments in true classical electrodynamics. But if you keep Maxwell's equations and simply add one extra term in the Lorentz force law, apparently you can get a coherent, consistent theory that's a little bit beyond, a slight generalization of classical electrodynamics that does allow for intrinsic magnetic dipoles and magnetic forces can do work on those intrinsic magnetic dipoles. So there's a hell of a long-winded explanation for what I've been working on. So very exciting to me because it would satisfy all these people that I've told magnetic forces, I still insist in classical electrodynamics, magnetic forces cannot do work. Simple as that. Open and shut case. Follow straight from the Lorentz force law. But if you're prepared to extend the Lorentz force law and you can prove that does not lead to internal inconsistencies as I suspected when I first saw this, then you could have a quasi-classical theory that does allow for magnetic forces to do work. And the interviewer is not at all interested in that, so he goes back to talk about the relativity book, which also sounds very interesting. I would love to have Griffith's version of relativity, although it was his advisor's notes, so uh, it would still be Griffith's, I think, um, with with the help from his advisor. But there it is, folks. Uh, that's the answer. He has written a book that's completely classical, and we know that quantum mechanics exists. So when we read it, we're like, but wait, spin exists. Intrinsic spin exists. I This could easily be fixed. Just add a little note. Add a little note that's like, of course we could do quantum mechanics, but this isn't quantum mechanics class. And then boom, no confusion. But anyway, the end of this video, magnetic forces can do work unless you're thinking completely in classical electrodynamics and then you have to come up with a bunch of currents to solve the problem. And that's okay, but I mean, we could just do quantum mechanics instead. Okay, bye. I got a couple of comments on my last video where I said I was scared of magnets that were like, why are you scared of magnets? And why aren't you scared of magnets? If you swallow a magnet and then you swallow a magnet a little bit later, you can die. Like magnets don't care if your body is in the way of them slamming together and they'll pinch your skin. 
uh, did you see that guy who took a gun into an MRI room and the magnet caused the gun to go off and it shot him in the stomach and he died? I don't want to brag, but I've gotten quite a few MRIs. And when you go, you sign a little waiver that says, you know that carrying metal in will cause damage to you. And you say, I don't have any metal on my body. And then the nurse looks at you and she says, you just signed this, but you know you can't have metal on your body. It's a big magnet. And then they walk you through a metal detector which they wouldn't let you go through if it goes off. And then the nurse again says, just, just to be sure you don't have any metal or anything on you. And then you get in the big magnet. All those steps have to happen. I don't understand how this story happened, but magnets are scary. Like these magnets, I'm not scared of holding them. I'm not scared of like touching stuff with them. But if I had like a 14 year old son named Tyler and he was like, can you buy me like 25 of these magnets? I would be like, no. What are you gonna do? You're gonna kill yourself with a bunch of magnets. Magnets are scary. You gotta be safe. Uh, all right, so why aren't you scared of magnets? That's my response. You should be scared of magnets, deal with it. I still insist in classical electrodynamics, magnetic forces cannot do work. Simple as that. Open and shut case, follow straight from the Lorentz force law.